Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. My guest is Ajit Singh. He is a lawyer and journalist who writes about China extensively, including for thegrayzone.com. Ajit Singh, welcome to Pushback. Thank you for having me. So tensions now are high between the U.S. and China, and a lot of allegations uh, being hurled in China's direction including accusing China of covering up uh, the outbreak of the coronavirus, of misleading the WHO, of the virus itself possibly being started uh, not via uh, animal to human transmission, but in fact inside a Chinese lab. Brett Baer's reporting tonight, if it bears out, shows that the Chinese Communist Party is responsible for every single death, every job lost, every retirement nest egg lost, from this coronavirus. And Xi Jinping and his Chinese communist apparatchiks must be made to pay the price. That was an allegation spread across the political spectrum, including by President Trump. We're looking at it. A lot of people are looking at it. It seems to make sense. They talk about a certain kind of bat, but that bat wasn't in that area. So a lot of strange things are happening, but there is a lot of investigation going on, and we're going to find out. Chinese agents uh, spreading disinformation, a lot of this stuff going on. But before we get into the specific allegations, I, I'm curious, your overall thoughts right now on the climate of hostility and antagonism towards China that we're seeing right now? Yeah, I think um, there's been a uh, noticeable escalation in anti-China hostility from the U.S. government establishment and corporate media. Um, in the past month or month and a half. Um, uh, at the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak, when the epicenter was in Wuhan, China, uh, much of the, the vast majority of the presentation that we received was that China was reacting in an authoritarian or draconian fashion when it was implementing its, its lockdown measures uh, in Wuhan um, and Hubei province. Um, as the United States has had to deal with this virus on its own shores and has struggled to contain it uh, in large part due to uh, inadequate responses by the United States government and other levels of government, uh, federal and state. Um, this narrative has shift from, shifted from uh, at, at initially China was behaving in a draconian over the top measure uh, manner to now China didn't do enough and that China was nefariously or maliciously covering up the coronavirus outbreak and is responsible for the troubles that the United States and other countries of the world are facing. Um, this isn't just an accident. Uh, it appears to be a coordinated campaign by the U.S. government uh, being aided by a very pliant corporate media. Um, we know this from a March 21st report in the Daily Beast, uh, which uh, had obtained a U.S. government cable outlining the White House's strategy to launch a PR campaign uh, as the United States was emerging as the world's worst coronavirus outbreak to shift blame from the U.S. government and onto China, specifically seeking to accuse the Chinese government of orchestrating a cover-up and of creating the global pandemic. Uh, since this time, we've seen an intense escalation by the U.S. government and the media, uh, which was already hostile uh, in rhetoric and accusations against China. Uh, these can largely be grouped into a couple of narratives that we've seen. Uh, we've heard that China's hiding uh, 40,000 or 50,000 additional coronavirus deaths from the official death tolls, uh, that the World Health Organization is a Chinese puppet that's uh, controlled uh, by the Chinese government. Um, and uh, most recently, we've seen the revival of a fringe conspiracy theory by more mainstream outlets uh, that the coronavirus was engineered in a Chinese lab, uh, either deliberately as part of a biowarfare program uh, or uh, through an accidental lab leak due to reckless research and unsafe uh, protocols. Um, and I think we're seeing both uh, parties of the U.S. establishment coalesce around this uh, anti-China narrative and seeking to sort of one-up the other and present themselves as the most ardently anti-China uh, uh, political force in, in, in the United States. And this is a very dangerous uh, situation, not just internationally, uh, because of the risks that it poses between the world's two strongest uh, global powers uh, in terms of aggressive confrontation, uh, but also it has a lot of domestic consequences in terms of emboldening uh, 
both parties and the political establishment to avoid uh, or blunt uh, the genuine deserved outrage of uh, ordinary Americans against the systemic failure of U.S. capitalism and of their administration, uh, it allows them to blunt this and try to shift them onto a foreign boogeyman in a way that's very similar to uh, the Russiagate narrative that's uh, been deployed since the 2016 election of President Donald Trump. So let me put to you uh, some of the key claims that are adduced to uh, pin the blame on China for and accuse it and the WHO of misleading the world about the coronavirus crisis. And then we'll get into some of the other examples that you mentioned. So there's a very famous tweet from the WHO from January 14th, and it says this, preliminary investigations conducted by the Chinese authorities have found no clear evidence of human to human transmission of the novel coronavirus identified in Wuhan, China. So you see this tweet, Ajit, uh, being produced a lot uh, as a way to accuse China and the WHO of lying uh, and, and claiming that there was no human-to-human -human transition of the coronavirus. Uh, how do you take that allegation? Yeah, it's gotten a lot of attention, uh, particularly by, by the right wing, but also a lot of uh, centrists and, and liberals uh, to suggest that, yes, China and the WHO uh, were either colluding to mislead the world about the severity of the coronavirus uh, outbreak or that China was duping the WHO. Um, I think if we focus on the balance of the evidence uh, as opposed to the wording of a single tweet, it's pretty clear that uh, this narrative is false. Uh, first, uh, the tweet, in fact, is referring to the January 14th press briefing by the WHO, during which they didn't say that there was no uh, human to human transmission, but stated that there was uh, the evidence thus far indicated limited human to human transmission. Uh, it's important to note at this time, coronavirus wasn't a worldwide pandemic. It was a mysterious illness uh, that of which there were only 41 cases. Um, still at this time, they issued a guidance to hospitals worldwide to be prepared for infection control and a possible quote super spreading event. Um, uh, gee, let me just read, let me read you quickly because that tweet gets a lot of attention, but that word you mentioned uh, that they said that there was actually limited human to human transmission, it was even reported at the time. So the same date, January uh, 14th from Reuters, and it says this, quote, there has been limited human to human transmission of a new coronavirus that has struck in China, mainly small clusters and families, but there is potential for wider spread, the WHO said on Tuesday. So it's just an interesting case where you have one badly worded tweet that gets a lot of attention, but contemporaneous uh, accounts from the time of that very same WHO press conference, like this one from Reuters, get no attention. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that uh, the terminology human to human transmission uh, has and limited human to human transmission uh, refers not only to uh, the extent of spread, uh, but also uh, to uh, the severity and and um, the degree to which the the pathogen is infectious. So limited to human uh, limited human to human transmission doesn't mean that a virus or or pathogen is not dangerous. It's a designation which has been applied to uh, very uh, dangerous pathogens such as bird flu viruses, uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which have been categorized under limited human to human transmission. So that in and of itself isn't, isn't an inherent downplaying. We see that very serious illnesses have given, been given the scientific designation. And the reason it's given this is because it refers to the degree to which it is infectious. Um, and at that time, it's important to note that these limited amount of cases, the vast majority of them were traced back to, uh, a, a wet market in Wuhan. And so it wasn't clear to the extent to which this is rapidly transmitting between people or to which all of these people have a link to this one source. Um, the designation limited uh, to human to human transmission is understood in contrast to what coronavirus was eventually designated as being sustained human to human transmission, which refers to how it being easily transmitted from one person to the next and onward uh, in the way that the flu works. Um, and uh, it's important to note that less than a week later, the WHO announced that there was evidence of sustained human to human transmission. So in this narrative in which we're supposed to believe that China 
uh, and the WHO are trying to uh, mislead the world, presumably for good PR or, or whatnot. Less than a week later, they, they've given themselves, what, six days of good PR to then switch to calling it sustained human-to-human transmission. And then three days later on January 23rd, the Chinese government implements uh, a, a systemic lockdown in Wuhan and other cities in Hubei province, which led to immediately being criticized uh, by the Western press. And so this whole narrative of, of, of misleading, it's hard to see what they were misleading for. The evidence, uh, in my view, uh, much more strongly indicates that as uh, evidence of this mysterious, unknown, uh, previously unknown virus was emerging, the assessments of the WHO and Chinese authorities were evolving rather than some sort of uh, conspiracy to mislead the world. And here's uh, one more thing that gets missed that I think is very important, which is that according even to Secretary Azar, uh, the U.S. government was informed by Chinese colleagues, not in February or late January about the coronavirus, but in fact on January 3rd. Um, Azar said this at a uh, White House press briefing uh, back in March. So we were alerted by some discussions that Dr. Redfield, the director of the CDC, had with Chinese colleagues on January 3rd. It's since been known that there may have been cases in December, not that we were alerted in December. Yeah, there's a, in addition to this, there's a New York Times article uh, which states that uh, the head of the U.S. CDC was informed directly by the Chinese CDC on January 1st. And the, according to the New York Times, the Chinese head of CDC uh, was in tears during this conversation. Um, in addition, the Washington Post reported this week that from the outset, there have been over a dozen officials, U.S. government officials embedded at the WHO that have been giving real-time updates to the to the Trump administration. So I think the whole narrative that Trump uh, or the United States uh, was not in the know or was uh, blindsided by the Chinese and WHO has no merit in terms of evidence. Right. I think that's a very good point. When people talk about the WHO covering something up or accusing them of that, they're forgetting that there are officials from all these member states, including the U.S. and other Western allies, inside the WHO, which would mean that if there were a cover-up, that would have to mean that these Western officials who are right there at the WHO are complicit in it. And the United States' own government officials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's take this to uh, this theory that has gotten a lot of attention as of late. Uh, Donald Trump himself spread it, but also people in liberal media as well, uh, this conspiracy theory uh, that COVID-19 actually originated inside a lab inside Wuhan province. So talk to us about what was claimed and then what the actual facts were, which you went through in a recent piece with Max Blumenthal for thegrayzone.com. Yeah, so um, in early January, a very fringe conspiracy theory in uh, right-wing outlets such as the Washington Times claimed that uh, the novel coronavirus was engineered as part of a bio-warfare program uh, by the Chinese government. Uh, this was roundly discredited uh, by uh, the scientific community first, but also mainstream media outlets uh, in the United States also, um, as being a nonsensical conspiracy theory. Uh, uh, a group of, uh, a team of US, British, and Australian researchers were quite emphatic uh, in a article in the scientific journal Nature in March, in which they said, um, "There's uh, we don't believe any type of laboratory scenario is possible, both engineering or that it was some sort of laboratory experimental construct. Um, and similarly, a group of dozens of public health scientists wrote an open letter in um, the Lancet Medical Journal stating that scientific findings to date overwhelmingly conclude that the coronavirus originated in wildlife, like so many other emerging pathogens, and condemned conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theories. Um, nonetheless, despite this conspiracy theory being discredited, and despite the overwhelming scientific uh, 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 st uh, stance against this sort of theory, uh, a sort of slightly altered version of this has been uh, attempted to be revived by uh, the by the Washington Post's Josh Rogan and the U.S. government, um, relying on a couple of State Department cables from 2018, 
Rogan alleges there were uh, dangerous safety issues and reckless research being conducted at uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, and that uh, that was studying China bat coronaviruses. Um, he bases uh, Josh Rogan his fear mongering about safety concerns uh, on a single comment by U.S. embassy officials who have no apparent scientific expertise, um, and the the comment referred to concerns that there weren't enough trained technicians at the laboratory. But Rogan's own cable, uh, in its own words, it says, most importantly, the thing that it identifies from its visit is that from a public health perspective, the research being done at this lab is critical to uh, preventing and predicting future emerging coronavirus outbreaks. Um, I think there's this, this, there's this idea that Rogan relies on that this is some sort of shadowy lab doing uh, reckless research when in fact it's uh, uh, the, it has the highest international standard of biosafety precaution uh, and it's one of dozens of such facilities around the world. The United States has 13 of these types of biosafety labs uh, uh, as of 2013 and the goal of this research is not some nefarious reckless purpose but to understand, uh, prevent and uh, treat these very deadly diseases. Um, this uh, biosafety lab was the product of not just Chinese initiative, but it was a Chinese-French joint collaboration. Um, and technicians who worked there were trained not only in the United States, not only in China, but in the United States, Australia, Canada, and France before the lab became operational. They've published their training protocols uh, transparently with the US CDC in a, in a journal that the US CDC runs on emerging infectious diseases. Um, and Rogan relies on this one comment in order to make this, this uh, very damning claim. And he doesn't speak to any scientists, any virologists, epi epidemiologists, anyone with expertise in the area. Instead, he relies on the insinuations of anonymous Trump officials and someone he refers to as a research scientist uh, who, in fact, is a Chinese dissident with decades of backing by the U.S. government and National Endowment for Democracy, who has no expertise in the area, but in fact teaches classes on blogging and internet freedom in China. Um, so uh, I think it's important um, to understand that this is not a genuine scientific article, but very much a WMD style uh, conspiracy theory attempting to gin up hostility against China. Um, it's important to note also that Rogan uh, and his work has been roundly criticized by virologists in the United States for um, presenting uh, vague claims that don't present a specific risk with the research being done on bat coronaviruses by Chinese researchers, um, and that they ignore the importance of this work. Uh, and uh, in, in response to th these criticisms that he didn't review, uh, interview any, any virologists or scientists for his study, Rogan claims that he spoke to top virologists, but he refuses to include their, their comments in his article or indicate what they said. He just says he spoke to them and they disagree with these other virologists that are, cr are criticizing him. He's also explicitly refused to publish the State Department cables in full uh, when asked to do so by scientists. Um, I think it's uh, uh, important uh, that we also uh, recognize that um, the work being done there, uh, there's no evidence that he provides that the work being done on coronaviruses is unsafe. He tries to smear the work of the head of uh, the lab's research on bat coronaviruses, uh, Xi Zhengli, um, and he cites a 2015 article in Nature uh, which refers to a debate by scientists over the risks associated with certain research done with bat coronaviruses. That article doesn't even name Xi Zhengli and refers to a study that was being conducted not in Wuhan, but in the United States and led uh, uh, by majority American researchers, um, of which Xi Zhengli was one of 13 co-authors. Um, and so uh, we can see that this is completely a speculative hit piece and not a substantive uh, concern with safety issues in this lab. Um, and it's very concerning that this article has not been met with any resistance by the so-called liberal uh, resistance to Trump. We've seen Chris Hayes of MSNBC promote it. We've seen Yashar Ali of the New Yorker magazine promote it, along with other liberal, uh, uh, liberal uh, media members who 
are purportedly anti-Trump, they're uh, helping mainstream this very fringe conspiracy theory, and that's very concerning to see. Yeah, I think Chris Hayes shared the article on Twitter and just wrote, yikes, which was my reaction to seeing Chris Hayes credulously share this article on Twitter without questioning it. Well, speaking of, of, of Russiagate uh, uh, peddlers, uh, let's talk about the parallels here to Russiagate. So that lab theory is a very good example of a conspiracy theory. Sometimes conspiracy theories turn out to be correct. In this case, though, you've just laid out some of the reasons why it is uh, very specious, to say the least, and you've detailed it even more in your piece with Max Blumenthal at thegrayzone.com. Now, Russiagate was based around a conspiracy theory that uh, Russia conspired with Donald Trump, and that's what decided the 2016 election. And it served multiple political goals that I've covered extensively uh, and you touched on, including helping Democrats excuse their loss uh, and also helping to helping the national security state uh, undermine Trump's calls, however sincere they were, of better calls with Russia and to you know keep Ru U the U.S. and Russia locked in a uh, dangerous Cold War. And now we're seeing, in the case of China, there are there is utility for the conspiracy theories we're hearing about China and the blame towards China. You know, there is an imperative in in maintaining uh, tensions with China and the very expense keeping the very expensive but lucrative for military uh, industry um, uh, coffers uh, cold war going uh, and also for deflecting blame from the failures here at home that failed to adequately uh, prepare uh, for the coronavirus and stop its spread so let's talk about these interests here um, i want to reach you a couple of things uh, there was a report by the congressional research service written in december of 2019 just before the coronavirus crisis began. And it notes that under Trump, um, the U.S. has escalated what's called this shift towards great power competition, away, shifting its national security strategy away from so -called, fighting so-called terrorism and instead uh, engaged in great power competition, namely with Russia and China. And the Congressional Research Service says this, quote, Department of Defense officials have identified countering China's military capabilities as the Pentagon's top priority. And since the coronavirus crisis has broken out, we've seen them capitalize on that, or at least pursue that goal. Uh, recently, uh, a report to Congress called uh, from, from the Pentagon asked for $20.1 billion in equipment, and I'm quoting from the New York Times here, in equipment, exercises, and defense investments to counter China in 2021 and beyond. Ajit Singh, if you could respond to all this. Yeah, I think we're seeing a um, an escalation of not a new phenomenon, but a longstanding bipartisan uh, strategy of the United States that dates back to, uh, at least in its modern iteration, the 2008 to 2000. 16 Obama administration, which uh, started off the pivot to Asia, which was the uh, military pivot of U.S. naval assets to the Asia Pacific. Um, and uh, this this trend has been escalated under the Trump administration with, as you mentioned, this sort of identification of, quote unquote, great power competition taking over from, uh, quote unquote, the war on terror uh, as the now primary objective of U.S. national security. Uh, we've also heard statements uh, at the recent, uh, a number of statements uh, uh, identifying China along with countries like Russia as the principal threat uh, of uh, facing the United States. Uh, in November, uh, at uh, a NATO ministerial meeting, uh, Mike Pompeo explicitly referred to the first Cold War and the victory, of, uh, the so-called victory of the Allies against the threat of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, he explicitly referred to that uh, with mention of now the threat facing, uh, the primary threat facing uh, the NATO allies in the United States being the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I think uh, there are a number of structural reasons for this in addition to the uh, um, narrow-minded or the, the narrow uh, self-interest of like the military industrial complex or the self-interest of politicians to avoid uh, criticism or to to redirect attention towards a foreign enemy. Uh, I think, um, and we've seen even the US left and critical voices unwilling to even acknowledge this, that China 
uh, presents an impediment, not just at the level of a, a conflict between two uh, equal powers, but it presents a, a, an impediment to the U.S. international strategy vis-a-vis -vis a host of uh, enemy countries. Um, China, while an imperfect country, is distinct from the United States in a number of important ways, um, ways that uh, uh, are incredibly important for other developing countries, for example, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, uh, Syria. Uh, for many of these countries, which the United States attempts to, in the words of uh, the Nixon administration, strangle or make the economy scream, China prevents, presents a source of uh, financing, economic engagement, and diplomatic support, which is not conditioned upon that government implementing neoliberalism or implementing um, a change in government, as we've seen the United States attempt to condition aid to Venezuela with, uh, with the Guaido uh, uh, situation. Um, and so this undermines really the, the foundation of the U.S. foreign policy and imperialism. Uh, and so uh, what we're seeing, I think the way that we should understand the current uh, situation isn't some sort of escalation coming out of nowhere, but really the U.S. establishment and both parties seizing on this current crisis in order to advance an already existing agenda that they have being new Cold War or great power confrontation or competition vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and I think this is extremely disturbing regardless of one's opinion on China, if we can bracket that for a second, um, it's incredibly disturbing for a number of reasons. One, it's revealing the incredibly low standard of evidence uh, required to make pretty much any claim about China, as long as it's useful to US foreign policy uh, and US agenda. Uh, as we've seen with this Rogan story or previous stories, citing unnamed social media reports to claim that China's hiding tens of thousands of uh, uh, coronavirus deaths, a standard of evidence we would never accept for uh, allied countries or for the United States itself. Um, this first is disturbing because uh, it's really ratcheting it up tensions uh, in the United States towards China and hostility. Um, a recent poll uh, of Republicans and Democrats from a couple weeks ago found that over 75% blame China for coronavirus and over 50% uh, say China owes reparations. That's a stronger position that they have to, than for reparations for African Americans for slavery, uh, let alone even considering reparations for any country the United States has destroyed. Uh, and most recently this week, an even more disturbing poll because it goes beyond just Republican and Democrat party members by Pew Research found that two thirds of Americans now view China unfavorably. That's up from 47% to just two years ago. Uh, nine out of 10 adults view China as a threat and 62% view China as a major threat. So this isn't just a, this obviously is a concern in terms of peace and international confrontation and all the fallout that that could have, but also it's a very dangerous from a domestic perspective, I think for ordinary working Americans and for progressive minded Americans. Um, we're seeing it's already empowering the right wing, uh, center right and far right to weaponize anti-China sentiment for nefarious ends. Um, we're already seeing a dangerous rise in racist hate crimes against people of Asian descent across the, the U.S. Um, uh, we saw the anti-quarantine protesters telling healthcare workers to, quote, go to China if they want communism. Uh, just this week, we've heard Trump refer to being attacked, the attack of an invisible enemy in order to justify his anti-immigration politics. Um, and it's also being uh, weaponized by both uh, parties of the establishment in order to, in the same way that Russiagate in 2016 was used to blunt any cr uh, self-critique of the Democrats' neoliberal policy, it's being used by both parties to blunt any critique of themselves or any systemic critique of U.S. capitalism uh, and holding those, those entities, uh, the, the, the U.S. system or the U.S. government responsible, instead trying to redirect genuine outrage towards China. Um, it's, it's obviously emboldening Trump to try to pin the blame for his administration's catastrophic failures onto a foreign enemy, but it's also being used by the Biden campaign and the Democratic establishment to, uh, to uh, blunt any sort of uh, critique or, uh, or policy concessions required being owed to the Sanders contingent 
uh, or Sanders campaign, because their apparent focus is to show how Joe Biden is more anti-China than Trump is and how Trump is selling out to China. And I think uh, this is a very dangerous strategy for those of us or for those in the United States who seek uh, progressive changes that will actually address the crises that are going on in the United States um, in terms of health care, debt, unemployment, uh, inequality. Um, and even for those who are solely concerned with just defeating Trump, as many centrists and establishment Democrats uh, uh, claim they are, this is this is absolutely, almost certainly a losing strategy because it ultimately provides uh, a justification for the basis of Trump's narrative that he's not responsible, but China is, if the Democrats just pursue a strategy of it's all China's fault. Uh, and so I think uh, for uh, people in America, I think uh, it's very important to resist this sort of uh, wholly exaggerated uh, dishonest representation of China uh, because it will very likely be used against them. Ajit Singh, attorney and journalist, writes extensively about China. You can find his work at thegrayzone.com. Ajit, thanks very much. Thank you.